perks of my job is that crowds like you usually show up with an opinion about spiders, right? Is anybody in here neutral about spiders? You just don't ever consider them? Okay, you're the, you're the extreme minority. <laughs> so I'm guessing that there are some people in here that are, you know, think that spiders are kind of cool. I saw some hands earlier, kind of cool. How about spiders are a little bit gross? How about spiders are horrifying and you wish they'd all go away? <laughs> right? Okay, so <laughs> that, was, that was actually pretty even. I, you know, if I remember, I want to do that at the end and see if I can change anybody's mind. <laughs> um, so I have a few goals for this talk. One of them is to try to um, explain to you why I am inspired by spiders. Um, my students and I actually often say inspired, so I might <laughs> just slip up on that. <laughs> um, so I want to I share with you all the things that I think they can teach us um, and all the things they have to offer us if we focus on their diversity. I also want to um, try to tell you about how we use an evolutionary perspective and how we take into consideration patterns of relationships and how that's applicable to a lot of different things. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the research we're doing on brown recluse and their relatives. All right. <clears throat> So, spiders. Um, as of October of this year, there are 45,700 species that are described. Um, that number, I gave this a talk like this just a couple years ago, was 43,000 species. That reflects a lot of active work of scientists that are discovering and describing new species. We're still on the steep part of the curve of discovery of these animals. Um, what's cool to me about them is that all of that diversity has evolved in the context of them being predators. Like, they have to capture live prey to eat. It would be like us having to go fishing every time we were hungry. So um, all of these species have evolved in a context of um, diversifying ways in which they, they capture venom, right? And so some of the features of spiders that capture people's attention are the tools that they use to capture prey. Um, so, did I just say capture venom? I meant the tool, I, I had took a red eye last night, so I'm probably gonna do that a lot. Just, <laughs> just sh wave your hand and say, I don't think you meant to say that, but the, the tools that they use to capture prey, which are silk and venom. Um, so, even though this is a talk about venom, I, wanna, I can't talk about spiders without sharing some information about silk, because it's just so cool. Um, so, silk is this phenomenal biochemical property, and it gets a lot of uh, publicity, of course. Um, Spider-Man, uh, actually, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly strong material. Spider-Man probably would have bounced on his head, though, because it's also very stretchy. Um, but there's a lot of attention by researchers to try to understand the proteins involved in silk because they have pretty phenomenal properties. Their, their tensile strength is really huge. Um, so spiders make silk by these st structures called spinnerets. And if you zoom in on those, they look a little bit like this. They have spigots that secrete these silk proteins. And of course, they use that to weave together these awesome webs. This is an orb web. Um, and a cool thing is that they use different silk types in different parts of the web. So a spider that makes a web like this called an orb um, makes seven different kinds of protein. And they turn those on and off um, for, to make the different architectural features. So um, these orb webs have radii, that's one silk protein. They have these spirals, that's a different silk protein that has um, gluey droplets on it. It's, it's stretchier so that they can absorb the impact of flying prey. Um, the dragline silk is a different kind of protein. Um, and the, the frame web is a different kind of protein. So they're, they're, they're these kind of architectural marvels that are designed to transmit vibratory information directly to the spider. Um, if you uh, go to the American Museum of Natural History, there's a, this is a tapestry that was made by the silk of these golden orb weavers, which I think show up sometimes in Florida. Um, uh, was that a sigh of, of fear or <laughs> enthusiasm? So um, these are in a genus called Nephila. Um, this took more than a million spiders. They actually just pulled the silk out. This is the natural color of the golden silk um, that they wove together to make this tapestry. Pretty cool. So, um, and I'll just read this quote. Only the females produce the silk, which is renowned for both its striking saffron color and its tensile, tensile strength. It's five to six times stronger than steel by weight. Um, 
but the females are notoriously cannibalistic, and so the reason why we don't have a lot of spider silk clothing is you have to rear them individually, or they just, you have one big fat animal, right? So <laughs> production is a little expensive. Okay, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about webs in just a second, but um, the other tool, of course, is the one that I study in venoms, and these capture imagination. Um, so the business end of a spider, venom-wise, is the, the, these are called chelicerae. At the tip of the chelicerae is a fang. Um, the venom is produced in a venom gland like this and secreted through the fang. This is a close-up of, of the gland itself with these um, bags of protein, little secretory granules of protein in the venom glands. The glands are kind of sausage-shaped and very muscular. <clears throat> But the cool thing about venom is that they're these complex mixes. Um, and the different, different species have very different mixes. So any guess how many chemicals would be in the venom of a single spider? Toss out a number, yeah? Guesses are great. Even right, wrong, high, low. Start the bidding. 40. 40. Good guess. More. 45. 45. <laughs> crank it up. Crank it up. <laughs> <laughs> there are hundreds to thousands, hundreds to thousands in a single spider. And I can guarantee you there's a spider in this room that's carrying around hundreds to thousands of chemicals. Did I just see a quiver up here? <laughs> I can also guarantee you that that spider won't hurt you, <laughs> um, even if it could bite you. So different species have different chemicals in their venom. How many species again? 45,000. 45, hundreds to thousands of chemicals all evolved in the context of these diverse types of cap capturing prey. So the roles they play are very different. Um, that's the thing that has totally engrossed me, is to try to understand the puzzle and the pattern that has generated that diversity. Um, so to set that up a little bit, and I love this part of a talk because I get to share the natural history stories about spiders that I, I, I find really inspiring. I want to give you a brief tour of spider diversity and really highlight the different ways in which spiders are using their silks and their venom. Um, okay, so spiders are arachnids, um, but spiders aren't the only arachnids. Anybody recognize other arachnids in this picture? Yep, yeah, we got scorpions, we got a tick. That's a, these are all different orders of arachnids, so kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So we got scorpions, we got ticks. Anybody recognize this guy? It's a pseudoscorpion, some of my favorites. Um, anybody recognize these? Uh, yeah, so um, tell the they're vinegaroons. These guys actually ha have a tail that got cut off here, but they secrete something that smells like vinegar to deter predators. Um, this guy, it's a sun spider, a sulfugid. This guy, you can only see part of it, but that's a, a whip spider or an amblypigid. Um, and this is a harvestman or an apiliones. How many of these are in Florida? Naturally, actually. <laughs> Florida is such an odd place because of all the crazy and um, things people have brought in. How many? All of them. All of them. Usually I travel around the country and give a talk and I have to make some of these go away. But you have the great fortune of all of these being found <laughs> natively. <laughs> and I say that sincerely, like I, I'm jealous. <laughs> we don't have these in Oregon. How many of them have venom? No, not all of them. We know these guys do, right? These guys do. One other one does. The pseudoscorpion. These guys are, are really small, like less than a millimeter, or I'm sorry, less than a centimeter. And, but they have venom in one of their, one of their, the keely, one of their pinchers um, on their thumb, basically. And uh, so, but these represent three different evolutionary origins of venom within arachnids. So. Very cool. Okay, my brief tour of spiders then. So um, there are two major groups of arachnids, one called my gallimorphs. My gallimorphs are tarantulas and their kin, and their, their chelicerae and their fangs basically bite down like this. So um, they'll bite down on prey. Anybody have a pet tarantula in this room? Oh, great. We'll talk afterwards. You're my, you're my kin. You're my kin. Um, <laughs> um, 
There are also mygalomorphs, a lot of them build burrows and have lids, like they have actually trap doors on the top. And some of them have French doors, some of them have one hinged doors, they're, they're really cool. <laughs> the, the classy ones have French doors. Um, but most of the species are in another major group called the raniomorphs. So most of the spiders that you see all the time actually have things that work like this instead of like this. Um, and so they're the ones that make um, webs that are above the ground that you can see. So just a few araneomorphs. So the orb weavers, are, again, are araneomorphs, garden spiders. I, I'm, I know that you have some of these around. Um, I just added this slide because I saw so many of these today walking around Jacksonville. Um, Gastrocanthic uh, canciformes. Um, apparently, they have a painful bite. Anybody, would, have anybody experienced that? Grab one with their hands. I'm not going to assign you that task, but I've heard that the bite is painful. It doesn't last any longer than a bee sting, but it's a, it's a painful bite. Um, so remember these guys? Nephila? So they make these big orb webs, and yes, that's a bat. So this is a, a picture taken in, um, in Peru uh, and, uh, of a, a, th these animals get quite big, but the strength of that silk, they can actually capture small birds. Yeah, I see people with like jaws open. It's like, yeah, yeah. Um. <clears throat> okay, a couple other cool, on the other extreme, the radiosoma are these tiny, tiny spiders, and they make orb webs. I'm going to talk about some der derivations of orb webs, but the spider sits on some um, plants nearby, and there's a silk line that attaches to the hub, and the spider will coil up that silk line and turn the orb into a cone, and then just sit there and wait. And then a lot of spiders have special hairs on their legs that actually are so sensitive that they can detect the wind made by wings beating. And so they know when an insect is, is nearby or on its way to the web, and they'll release the web at exactly the right time, it'll slam into the prey, and there's no escaping. Yeah, <laughs> chuckles. <laughs> I know. And they, they are really good at catching mosquitoes, actually. I see them. I'll be out in the forest and in the tropics with mosquitoes buzzing around, and these webs are just binging um, with them catching mosquitoes. It makes me very happy. But there's a spider, that, one of them that has a really big muscle um, from holding that web, and a friend of mine wanted to call it Thridiosoma Schwarzeneggeri. I don't think it ever got formalized, but... <laughs> um, other related spiders, actually, this is a derivation of an orb web, but the, um, the silk is actually attached to the water. So they can pull the silk lines down and somehow um, basically make a small knot that makes it um, held tightly on the water. And so insects that are emerging from the rivers will get caught in those webs. Um, you actually have some of these around here, Dinopus ogreface spiders. So if you're out in um, pretty pristine areas, you can see them at night. But these actually, the orb web has been reduced to something that they hold in their front legs. So they'll hang underneath, web, underneath um, uh, leaves uh, with this web in their arms. And they too can sense insects that are flying by with these delicate hairs. And they literally just fish them out of the air. So they, 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 they scoop them up with their webs. Um, but one of the coolest, you also have these in Florida, I'm so jealous, um, is a bolus spider. So what's left of the orb web is a single silk line with a glue droplet at the bottom. And they sit and dangle that glue droplet and just wait until a male moth comes by. And at exactly the right time, they swing that glue droplet back, slap the moth that gets stuck, and they reel it in, and they feed. So looks something like this. Um, so what's up with the male thing? Why males? What are males attracted to? Females. <laughs> yeah. So it turns out these guys infuse the glue droplet with a pheromone mimic. And they're luring in male moths that think they're going to find a female. And instead, they get, they get slapped with glue and consumed. That's a bad night. Um, <laughs> But if you think about like the lifespan of one of, these, one of these spiders versus the mating season of a moth with a particular pheromone signal, the lifespan is longer. So it turns out that these spiders can change the pheromone concoction in their glue droplet seasonally to attract different species. We have no idea how. Nobody's studied that. But um, OK, any, any increases in the coolness factor, you guys who were thinking they were gross? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean. I, I don't, you can't make this stuff up, it's too good. 
Um, a spider that may be more familiar to you is uh, the, this is a black widow. This is a western black widow, um, striking black with an hourglass. These webs are also thought to be derived from orb webs. They make a tangle of silk, um, but they have glue droplets that they stick to the ground, um, and they catch prey that are walking along the ground surface that break the surface tension of those, um, of those silk lines and pull prey up off, off the ground, so they can catch fairly big things with those webs. <clears throat> Okay, so there are other spiders that don't make webs at all, though. Um, one of my favorites is a crab spider that sits in flowers, uh, and they pick off pollinators. And sometimes these pollinators might be 10 times their size. Like, they'll take um, moths, uh, butterflies, bees, um, and they have tiny little jaws. So it's just the power of the venom that immobilizes prey. They don't rely on silk at all. Um, we know nothing about the venoms of these spiders. Nobody's looked yet. There are spiders that sit on the sides on rocks next to streams and dive under the water and catch fish. <laughs> they can actually break the water tension, the water, the, the surface of the water, and dive down and catch fish. Um, another set of my favorites, we sometimes call these like the butterflies of the spider world, are jumping spiders. These have big eyes. They can actually see color, um, and they stalk prey like cats. Like literally, they'll just kind of orient sneak up very slowly, and then pounce. Um, so I like to call this guy the optimist because that's a pretty big prey item, but um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and this is the last of the natural history stories, but um, one of my favorites. There are spiders that literally spit glue on their prey, spitting spiders. And so um, they look like this. These are around here too, actually. You've got some native species in, in, uh, in Florida. Um, but so if you remember that, that venom gland I showed you before, these guys have a, a modified gland that just is full of glue. And so as they, they approach prey and they spit glue out and zigzag it um, to tether these prey to the ground. And of course, I have to show you a video of that because it's just too cool. <laughs> um, so this one, just to orient you, you can see the fangs right there, the glue's being extruded. These are high-speed videos that have been slowed down, so you can actually see it fairly well. This one, the spider's in the background, looking kind of blurry, and it's going to spit its glue and it'll zigzag between those two metal bars. Did you see that? <laughs> it is contractile and it's adhesive. Um, should we watch that again? <laughs> Yeah. No, that was actually slowed down a little bit. Yep, it's a super fast action. Okay. <clears throat> so, my point is, a major theme here, is that all these spiders use their venoms and silks in very different ways to capture prey. So we've got this context of you know, over 45,000 species. They've, they've been evolving for at least 300 million years and diversifying in their prey capture tactics. So I want to tell you a little bit more about venom then. So um, I mentioned how many different components there are. Well, what are they? So this is um, intended to illustrate a venom gland with a venom duct coming out that way. There are different kinds of molecules. There are proteins. There are little peptides, which are just small um, versions of proteins. And there are some small organic compounds. So these combine to make up the full mix. And the things, one of the things that excites biologists uh, is the, the kinds of things that they do. So these dissolve intracellular matrices. They are cytolytic. They cause cells to pop. Um, they're proteases that just break up proteins. Um, there have been antimicrobials that have been discovered in spider venoms. Um, but the ones that get a lot of attention are those that manipulate the nervous system. Um, and they do that in a very precise way. Because, you know, what, what's a spider using its venom for, largely? to immobilize prey. So they're loaded with these things that just impact the nervous system in very specific ways. So, um, and they, ha they have these little toxins. So this is a little biochemistry. This is gonna make you feel like you're in school for a second, but I'm um, trying to make it not very painful. So these are little peptides, the sequence of them. They have these little tightly folded knots 
um, and little spots that are highly variable that, um, that make them highly specific in how they work. And this is a diagram of the nervous system. So the nervous system works either in, like nerves communicating with muscles or nerves and nerves by passing chemicals back and forth. And so there's a lot of stuff going on in those neuromuscular junctions. And this just illustrates the complexity. You've got calcium that's being moved back and forth, sodium that's being moved back and forth, and potassium, for example, all kinds of different channels that the, the venom toxins can either plug or turn on or um, uh, they can do all kinds of things to it. And so there's a lot of um, potential in these venoms for developing things like insecticides or drugs. Um, and this is a diagram that's, that illustrates some of the venom toxins from spiders um, that actually are, that might have some promise for insecticidal activity. For example, this latrotoxin is actually the, the toxin in um, black widow venoms, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But what it basically does is it, it binds to this neuromuscular junction, makes a hole in it, and then it turns it on, and it doesn't shut off. So if you're bitten by a black widow, you get these painful cramps that don't stop for about 24 hours. Um, but then they do stop, and usually people are just fine. So, um, uh, so it's, it's just painful and a little bit long-lasting. But there are toxins that affect these potassium channels and calcium channels. This is the one that I studied from the brown recluse um, called the sphingomyelinase that affects um, the cell surfaces. So the point here is just that there's a lot of complexity and a lot of excitement about potential things that can be discovered from this. So um, they can be used for pest control, um, for new medications with very precise activities. Um, or uh, it turns out that these toxins are so diverse and they've evolved such specificity that they bind to things in the nervous system with, that go beyond, with specificity that goes beyond our understanding of the nervous system. So they're used as tools to learn more about the nervous system. Like, does that make sense? Yeah, so, um, and it, so if you just think about the little peptides alone, they're estimated to be about 9 million venom peptides in spiders and less than 0.01% um, have been explored so far. So there's just like a gold mine of chemicals in there um, that uh, people are excited about. And there are some drugs that have been developed from venom chemicals. This is one called Prealt that came from a cone snail. I, I, any, were any of you at the cone snail talk? Um, Toto Oliveira gave a talk. He was a, a, a role model of mine. Um, so these are predatory snails uh, that harpoon their prey and have cool toxins. So, but a, a, a drug has been developed that treats chronic pain. Um, it turns out that this funnel weaving spider has um, a component that does exactly the same thing. So evolution has led to that solution for immobilizing prey a couple times, um, but it's being used to treat pain. Um, there's a, a Brazilian uh, uh, wandering spider that has a component that is being, that's actually almost in trial um, as an erectile dysfunction, uh, uh, dysfunction treatment. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> so, um, and here are some other things, some venom toxins that are inspiring drug design. There's one that's uh, an active hypertensive peptide from a snake in Brazil. There's one that treats type 2 diabetes from a Gila monster saliva. There's one that targets um, uh, cells associated with brain uh, cancer coming from scorpion toxins. So um, there's a, this is a very active area of research right now. <clears throat> okay, but a lot of people, um, I hear this question a lot, a lot of people are interested in venoms uh, or in spiders because they're concerned about what might have bit them. Um, any of you, how many of you think you might have been bitten by a spider? Or you know people, right? How about brown recluse? You know people that you think have been bitten by a brown recluse? They said, yeah, so um, the issue of, of being bitten by a spider is a difficult one because it's notoriously hard to diagnose. And I like to talk about it with groups like you guys because it's an example of what we consider to be good evidence, right? So if you were going to feel like you had really good evidence of being in a, a bitten by a spider, what would you want? What, like, what would be good evidence? Actually, seeing the spider. That's, that's a really good first bit of evidence, right? There are other things like I'm hearing a couple, two holes, or um, there are symptoms that you might have that are consistent with what we think we understand about spider bites. But the reality is they're often... They're, very frequently blamed when there's no evidence of a spider nearby. Um, 
And there are many other phenomena that can cause similar lesions. I, I didn't put a slide that includes this, but um, MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aurea, is one of the culprits that gets blamed. Um, uh, brown recluse get blamed for that all the time. There were the an Remember the anthrax case in, in New York City? Guess what, who was blamed first? A brown recluse. <laughs> so the lesion that resulted from the actual an anthrax case in Manhattan a decade or so ago was initially um, diagnosed as a brown recluse bite, even though, are the, do you think there are brown recluse in, in Manhattan? There aren't brown recluse. There's a Mediterranean relative there, so it's not out of the question, but um, they're commonly misdiagnosed by medical professionals, even though um, there's not good evidence. So yeah, um, it's a, just an example to think about what is good evidence. To have really definitive evidence, um, it's good to take a tissue biopsy, and actually you can detect venom peptides in, um, in the bite site. That's really not readily available, but actually seeing the spider, catching it, and having somebody identify it is also really helpful. But. Okay, so um, there are only a handful of spiders of the 45,000 that actually do, we, are, we know do cause um, medical problems. Um, the two, people ask me all the time what the most poisonous spider is in the world. Um, or the most toxic spider to humans. And there are two groups, neither of which are in North America, that I, are the answer. Both of these types of, of spiders, one is the Australian funnel-weaving spider, and one is this Phonutria South, um, uh, uh, South American wandering spider. And they have a kind of a trifecta of, of issues. They're big, they have toxins that actually affect people, and they're grumpy. <laughs> they're, they're cranky, um, aggressive spiders. Most spiders will run away if you're near them, including the black widow and the brown recluse. Um, so uh, in the United States, there are only two types of spiders that have venom that are known to hurt people. Um, the black widow, of course, and here's a picture of the brown recluse. Um, these are both groups of species. They're not just one species. Uh, I think there are five species of black widows um, in the, on the continent and 11 of the brown recluse, so I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But the black widow first, um, their venoms are really interesting. They have a set, the, this toxin I pointed out before that bores a hole and dumps out neurotoxins, um, is actually a family of toxins. So it turns out in their genome, there are five different copies that do basically the same thing, but five of them only act on insects. One is specific to vertebrates, and one is specific to crustacea. Um, what are crustacea? They live in the ocean. A lot of them live in the ocean. It includes, like, you might have eaten some tonight. Exoskeletons, yes. So, like, crabs, crayfish, lobster. Mm. Um, but also, so do you think black widows are eating crabs? No, there's, there's actually a terrestrial uh, crustacean called a, a pill, a pill bugs, isopods. So they eat isopods, and we think that that toxin is there because of the crustaceans in their diet. What about vertebrates? Do you think they eat vertebrates? They're, they're small animals, um, but this is a picture taken in Mississippi from a friend of mine. Um, and living in Arizona, when my, my PhD, I often saw black widows eating lizards. So that web I told you about is so strong that it can pick up a very big vertebrate, and these spiders will actually eat them. So that toxin has evolved to help them immobilize vertebrates. We're far too big for them to immobilize and eat. Have no fear. Um, <laughs> but uh, they do actually eat vertebrates. Now, the species that's going to be the most common around here is, this is a Latrodectus geometricus, or the brown widow. Um, it's the most abundant of this type in Florida. So um, if you're going to encounter one of these, this is the most likely. However, there are um, more rarely actual black widows around. Okay, so brown recluse. Um, these guys have, they're brown. Uh, they have six eyes in three pairs. Most people don't get that close to be able to see them, but that's one of the diagnostic features. And of course they have, people say, a violin pattern. That's also hard to detect. A lot of spiders have that. So people frequently think they've seen brown recluse when they actually haven't. Um, so I'll talk more about the range of those in just a moment. But these have a toxin that's what we call a necrotoxin. Um, so it actually uh, causes skin death. Um, and the toxin itself is an activity called sphingomyelinase D. It's an enzyme that binds to a protein on the cell surface and snips it at a very specific site. That's what the, the sphingomyelin is, the protein, and um, the D is the site where it's snipped. 
And this is a case in Arizona where we actually collected the spider and did a tissue biopsy, and it was a confirmed Arizonica, Loxosceles Arizonica spider bite. <clears throat> So for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the work that we do and the logic behind it. Um, and, uh, and, but the major punchline is, um, obviously, I'm super excited about biodiversity, but I want to convince you that, um, that about how, we can under how understanding biodiversity and evolution can help with um, diagnostics and treatments of bites, so understanding which spiders are the most painful or most dangerous, and um, drug discovery. So I'm going to start with a little cartoon illustrating a logic that we use. Imagine, and this is actually kind of the case in most places, or many places, if this was, these were spiders out in a field, like out in the yard. And we didn't know, most spiders, nobody's really looked at the venom, um, so whether or not they're dangerous is, is not well known. But let's say we have one species out there, and we know it's harmful, and another one out there, we know it's not harmful. So the logic we use is that if we place these in a family tree that tells us how they're related to one another, um, it gives us a lot more ability to make smart guesses about what these spiders might be like. So this is something called a phylogeny, and it's basically a map of genetic descent. And so time is going in this direction, and anywhere on these branches represents something that actually lived at some point, like some ancestor. Okay, so we've taken that set of unknown spiders, we've put them in this context, and that gives us a lot of information, right? Um, so if I was going to ask you, what do you think the effect of this animal would be based in this context, and we're going to predict? You might guess it was safe, because it's related to things that were safe. In fact, based on this phylogeny, we guess that ancestor was safe, that ancestor was safe, and probably this one is too. But what about this guy over here? Yeah, more likely to be harmful, right? Um, but as we start to sample more and more animals and we fill this out, let's say we now know this. Um, what's, how does that improve your guess? That's better evidence that this is harmful, right? So if we know how spiders are related to one another, even if we don't go test every single species, we can make better guesses about what their venom might be like. Okay, everybody on board? Sorry. <laughs> I meant to, like, so I just showed you a phylogeny. I'm going to show you the most grisly, ugly phylogeny, but bear with me. I'm going to give you some points, so you're ready for phylogenies. <laughs> in this case, this is a tree of all the different families of spiders. So, um, and time, in this case, is going this way. And what I want to illustrate is the things that have red boxes around them are the four groups I mentioned that actually can hurt people. They're not closely related to one another. They're spread out on the tree. Um, some of these have green boxes around them, meaning we've studied them and we know, we know that they don't have chemicals that really hurt people. Um, but look at all of this, all of these types of spiders that we don't know anything about, right? So of this diversity, very little of it has been explored. Um, the groups we're studying are these right here with arrows. So you're going to hear more about that branch of the tree of life, all right? Um, okay. So we do evolutionary analyses of the venoms of the brown recluse and their relatives. Um, and we're asking the questions, which species have the chemical, um, uh, have the, have the chemical in there and the venom that can hurt people, and how much does it vary among species? And the relevance for this is, uh, how can we develop a treatment that would work around the world? And are there chemicals in these venoms that might be useful to people? So this is the, this is the relevance of the work. And when I say we do this, it's me and a team of really extraordinary undergraduates at Lewis and Clark College. So nearly all the work I'll talk about has been done by undergraduates. Okay, so a little more about this group. So here's the, ship, the picture I've shown you before. There are other species. This is one that lives in Africa. This is one that lives in Arizonica. Or I'm sorry, in Arizona. <laughs> its name is Arizonica. <laughs> You've heard of Arizonica, haven't you, right? It's like... <laughs> It's like Portlandia. <laughs> um, okay, so there are roughly 100 species in this genus that includes the brown recluse. Their closest relatives are these funny things called six-eyed sand spiders. They're super cool. I could give a whole lecture on them. They bury themselves in the sand, and they have specialized hairs that, that make particles stick to them. So they become exactly the background of the color of the background. It's like the perfect camouflage. Um, recognize this guy? So they're relatively close to related, and then there are a couple types of spiders um, in this group that um, you've never heard of but are cool. 
Um, so in the United States, um, this is where brown spiders live. There are 11 species native to the United States and 50 in North America. Note that we are somewhere around here. Brown recluse proper are not here. They're, this is an area they're not usually found near coastal areas. So um, if you think you've seen a brown recluse, it very well might be something else. There's a non-native uh, uh, relative that shows up in houses sometimes, but we're outside of the native zone of the brown, brown recluse. So. Um, and here's where they live in the world. So again, 50 species in, in um, North America, about 25 in South America, uh, and they're also in Africa and around the Mediterranean. And their, their relatives, the six-eyed sand spiders, are found in South America and Southern Africa. So we've been really fortunate to get funding that has allowed us to travel around and collect these animals. And whenever I say this to people, people are like, oh, can I come and carry your bags? I can promise you, you don't want to do that because <laughs> this is what we do. We fly, this is in Namibia, and we go straight into the deserts and stick our heads in holes. And it's full of like rodent poo, and um, we scrape around and we catch these animals. Um, but we've collected in all these places. These are our, uh, mostly undergraduates. This is a, outside of a cave in Argentina where we found um, some really cool species for the first time. Um, this is really, really fun work. Um, right now, I'm not going to talk about this in much more detail, but we've got a major project going on in the Caribbean, so we've collected at all these localities um, for this work. This is a team of undergraduates just emerging from a cave. And so, and wherever we go, we try to spend time doing outreach. So this is us working with some school children in the Dominican Republic. Really fun. <clears throat> And here's another one of those trees, so bear with me. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple simple patterns. So we use these molecular, we, we bring them back, we get DNA out of them, and we use that to figure out relationships. These are the six-eyed sand spiders, and these are the um, loxosceles, the relatives of the brown recluse. If we map on where we got them, we see a pretty interesting pattern. So the African species and the South American species are, are um, each other's closest relatives. And if you look at the brown recluse, you've got these African species, um, South American species, and North American species. Uh, that are kind of clustered in geographic groups. Does that make sense? Um, this is where it's late, and it just let me know if I, if I lose you. But um, it turns out this pattern is what you'd predict if these spiders were found on Gondwana, which is a supercontinent that was over 95 million years ago. Um, and so uh, we've hypothesized and tested with some various measures that these, these um, are old groups that were likely present on the supercontinent. Now, how did they get to North America? Well, this, we estimate this answer is between 24 and 40 million years ago. The modern connection between South America and North America is only 3 million years old. So how do you, do you think they swam, <laughs> rode? Um, it turns out, and we've got a lot of evidence, that they crossed over a land bridge that was the, um, the, the Caribbean, um, created a land bridge called, called Garlandia that was 32 to 34 million years ago. And so we think they crawled over to North America um, over that land bridge. Isn't that cool? Yeah, so these are the puzzles that are really fun for us to solve. But that gives us an idea of how old this lineage is and a framework in which we can study their venom. Okay, so we bring spiders back alive, which is not an easy thing to do, and um, we get venom out of them. And so I want to show you a, just a really short video of how we do that. Okay, hi, I'm Greta Binford, a professor of biology at Lewis and Clark College. And in my lab, uh, my students and I study the venom of brown recluse and their relatives. And we're interested in, in better knowing the diversity of the toxin that causes lesions when these spiders bite people. So we travel around the world, we collect species related to the brown recluse, we bring them back, and we, among other things, look at their venom. I have in my hand here a spider that's in the genus Sicarius, which is a, a very closely related to the brown recluse. And the spider's sleeping. I've, been, I've put it to sleep with carbon dioxide. And uh, now I'm going to show you how I collect venom from it. No spiders were harmed in this activity. <laughs> and I'm going to rinse her fangs. Um, try to get some of the sand off. And the, this thing in my left hand is a little vacuum that I've created that I'll put on the spider's mouth. Now I'm going to deliver about 12 volts of electricity through this spider's cephalothorax, and that'll cause the, the venom glands to constrict and the venoms to come out. It'll also cause the spider to vomit. 
So this thing in my left hand will capture the vomit so it doesn't contaminate the venom. Don't you all have a vomit vacuum? <laughs> this is the dentistry right. part. Just rinsing the fangs with a little bit of water, making sure that my vomit vacuum is working. <laughs> There's still a lot of sand on the spider, but that's okay. Okay, now I'm gonna, I have a glass capillary in my right hand. So I'm gonna place right next to the fangs. You're gonna see the venom go up this tube. And I'm gonna step on a foot pedal that will deliver 12 volts of electricity through the spider. And if all works well, you'll see the venom going straight into that tube. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a lot of venom going into that glass capillary tube. And... Um, that was kind of a mother load wow, of venom. that's a lot of venom. It doesn't see really work that well. All of that is venom that came out of that spider. So we'll take that venom and we'll, um, we'll assay it to make sure that the toxin that causes lesions that we know well from the brown recluse is actually there. And then we're, we're um, getting the gene sequence for that toxin. We're comparing it to this, the toxin in the brown recluse. And that'll help us to better understand the diversity of the toxin and may help us uh, develop treatments that will work worldwide for anyone who's bitten by any species in this group. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really do wake up just about five minutes later and just kind of shake themselves off and go about their business. We, we joke that it's electrotherapy for them. And <laughs> um, okay, so uh, a little bit of data. So, that we, uh, so I said in the video, we assay for the activity. This is just a graph that shows spiders from all over the, the world. So the full range of um, brown recluse relatives and those six-eyed sand spiders. And big bars here mean that that enzyme was present, right? So we determined that it's present across all of the brown recluse around the world. Um, it varies a little bit in how much we, how, what kind of signal we get. It's also in their relatives, the six-eyed sand spider. So um, it, there's something funny going on in South America, though, that we ha can't quite explain, but they have the gene in there that codes for the proteins and that it's also expressed in their venom. So, but things that are outside of that group, we don't detect it at all. Um, so uh, this is consistent. Again, this is a phylogeny time going in this direction with something happening before the common ancestor of these two genera that turned on that toxin in those venoms. So we can predict that everything descendant from it um, has that toxin. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, of course, this conclusion depends on solid evidence of absence which as a scientist is hard to get. So we're still scrutinizing these relatives um, to make sure that it's not there and we haven't missed it. Um, you might ask why this toxin is in the venoms. Um, it's really, we think it's probably not there to uh, affect vertebrates. Um, it turns out it's a really highly potent neurotoxin. If we inject it into crickets, the crickets start to twitch and they die very quickly actually. So um, it's, this is a, a graph of insecticidal potency, so these big bars. Um, we had a blank that uh, doesn't register at all there. Um, so this is a slightly more technical, but what we're doing with these venoms now is so we can get the venom. We can, uh, we're trying to, using a process called transcriptomics. Um, this is a, a picture of a cell, and so DNA is in a nucleus. It gets transcribed to make proteins. So we can actually capture a step that tells us which of the genes are making proteins. That's called transcriptomics. Um, and we're using proteomics um, to figure out all the proteins that are in that venom. So we're marrying those two to analyze these venoms. Um, and we're doing that to try to get good evidence of absence for all of these things that are um, related to the brown recluse and the six-eyed sand spiders. Um, and so all of these types, these spiders in green, this is a, the group that contains these spiders in the tree of life. They're called the haplogynes. They all have fairly simple genitalia, and they, most of them have less than six eyes. Um, but it includes spiders like, this is the, the daddy longleg, right? You guys heard that, that story? So if they could only bite you, <laughs> they could kill you. It turns out this, the spider version of that, a daddy long leg, it's already been demonstrated, doesn't have venoms that can kill you. But we're um, finding lots of interesting 
uh, components in them. It would take, so a friend of mine was on Mythbusters. He collected s t venom from 20 spiders. If you inject that into a mouse, you can kill it, but it takes 20 of the daddy long wig venoms, um, spider venoms to actually kill a mouse. So it would be hard to kill us. Um, we actually got this spider in New Zealand on a study abroad trip um, just this last spring uh, with a student of mine, cute little guy. This is only, uh, there are only three species in this whole family, and we managed to find them. Um, so this is just to illustrate what we're doing. We're actually looking at these transcripts. We're testing for activity. Um, and even with this denser sampling, we're still finding it within the group that includes the brown recluse, but nowhere else. And so our evidence of absence is starting to get stronger and stronger and stronger, but we're still trying to scrutinize that. Now, I want to um, kind of bring this to a close by um, coming back to this development of treatment thing. Like in the video, and I've advertised that we can use this information to try to create a treatment that would work worldwide. Now, there, are, there is no treatment for brown recluse bites in the United States. Um, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. There's one in Mexico, um, and people have worked on, on them in parts of the world where the problem is a little bit bigger than it is here. Um, and the treatments are actually antibody-based. So what they'll do is they'll take venom, inject it into horses, harvest the blood plasma of horses, and um, collect the antibodies that the horse makes against these proteins. And then if you inject those antibodies into somebody who's been bitten by a spider, um, and they're similar enough, they'll, the antibodies will bind to those chemicals and stop the activity. That's a process called neutralization. Okay? So... Um, just to model a little bit about what's going on, this is a little complicated, but bear with me. I'll, I'll try to make it as clear as possible. If we think about a spider venom again, venom of a single spider, some components that I've labeled here in green are the ones that actually affect people, only a subset of them. Um, and another subset is what we call antigenic. So if you inject it into a horse, the horse will actually produce antibodies. Um, what we want to find is the subset of antibodies that actually binds to things that are bioactive. But if you're bitten in the United States by a brown recluse and the only antivenom available is something that's been developed somewhere else against another related species, we want to know if it's going to work, if there's going to be enough similarity that the antibodies will bind to the different species venoms. Does that make sense? Based on what you now know about what we can use a phylogeny for, do you think that'd be helpful? <laughs> So you could use relatedness as a way to predict how similar these things are. Oops. Um, so if you have species A and species B, um, we can ask if the treatment would work, if these venoms are similar enough that the set of bioactive components and antigenic components are going to overlap. So we've done that, and it turns out that you get something called antigenic cross, antigenetic cross-recognition of the sphingomyelinase D across the entire group of spiders that we study. That means that if you have the protein for um, the toxin that causes lesions and you have an antibody from any other species, it'll um, recognize it. Um, however, for a treatment to work, it's actually got to recognize it and bind to it so firmly that it stops the activity. That's something called neutralization. It turns out that the set of species that are cross-neutralized is a smaller set, so it doesn't span quite as much distance. So to create a globally effective antivenom, you'd want to combine antibodies raised against a, a range of species across the full phylogeny. Does that make sense? And if we did that, something developed in Mexico would work well in the United States. It turns out that the species in the United States are similar enough to the ones in Mexico that it will work even if you use a Mexican species. Right? Isn't that cool? So if you were the FDA, would you approve an antivenom from a species made in Mexico based on what you now know? Well, call your local FDA representatives. They have not attended this lecture. <laughs> okay, so, um, and we can summarize uh, what we now know. We think that within this group of spiders, um, the s close relatives have bites that won't hurt people. Um, most of the species in, the, in this family, the Sicariidae, have bites that do hurt people. And will an antivenom developed with brown recluse venom work on related species? If you make it from the brown recluse, Will it work in Mexico, South America, South Africa? Yes, depends on the species, and no, you get too far apart, right? Okay, the last point I want to make um, is that we now know, these are pictures of the proteins in the whole venoms of a bunch of different species. 
this is where the sphingomyelin ASD is. There's a bunch of other stuff in these venoms, and we're just starting to have fun exploring these. This is a complex slide, but it's kind of a, you know, for me as a researcher, this is what we're most excited about right now. We can actually use the logic we use for this toxin and map that. So this, this is where the sphingomyelin ASD originated. We're looking at all the other things in the venom and figuring out the ones that are old, that are found in all spiders, and the ones that are actually unique to individual groups. And it turns out there are a lot of things in the brown recluse that are these little peptide neurotoxins that are, we're only finding in that group. So this is the bigger part of the puzzle that we're really working on right now. Okay, so some key points to leave you with. <laughs> Can you agree? Like, anybody not yet convinced the spiders are awesome? <laughs> okay. Anybody change their mind tonight? All right, All right. now I sound like a preacher. <laughs> um, so, and spider venoms are a storehouse of exciting new chemicals, and a more general point is that knowing the diversity of things that are living around us, literally, like right around us, is the, it's the, that's where we find discovery. You just have to look really closely at those things, and there's so much inspiration um, and human use in them. But under, oops, gosh, I didn't mean to push that. But understanding the diversity enables discovery. Most spider bites don't affect humans. There's no reason to be afraid of the spiders near you. In fact, watch them, be inspired by them, thank them for the bugs that they eat. Um, and I hope you understand how using an evolutionary perspective has human application for problems like this. Okay, a lot of people to thank. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah. Can you uh, give a look at that spiders here and wolf spiders? I saw one yesterday. Which is in the tarantula family, right? Oh. No. Thank you. Oh. Um, so the question is that you have a lot of uh, banana spiders and wolf spiders. It turns out neither of those are tarantulas. They're both in the araneomorphs with their jaws that look like this. Wolf spiders, um, I talked about jumping spiders. So jumping spiders are kind of like the cats of the spider world because they stalk their prey. Wolf spiders are kind of like the dogs, the wolves of the spider world. I mean, they actually, they're active at night. Um, they also wander in search of prey. Um, and they get really big, but their size shouldn't deceive you that they actually are tarantula-like. They, they just, some of them get really big. You have some that make holes in the sand here called geolycosa that are really gorgeous animals. Um, there's no evidence that they have venoms that are harmful. Okay, so you could actually grab one and pick it up? It's not going to bite you? Know, you I generally don't hurt. recommend that as a rule, but, um, <laughs> 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 but if, you, you know, if you handle them gently, there's no reason for right. them to bite you. If you grab and squeeze one, you're just oh, asking yeah. for it. And most, you know, the bigger the spider is, the bigger their fangs are, and you'll, you'll feel it. I mean, it'll be painful. Mm -hmm. Like a tarantula, most tarantulas don't have dangerous chemicals in their venom, but they're, have you seen tarantula fangs? Yeah. It'd be like stabbing yourself with a fork. <laughs> Except they're a little sharper than that. I mean, it's, it's something to avoid. <laughs> um, banana spiders are also, they're not related to uh, tarantulas either. Um, and they're also harmless. Banana spiders, it depends on what you're calling. It, uh, as long as it's not the Brazilian wandering spider. Could you clarify for us um, <clears throat> the... Uh the way they eat. I, I guess I've read or heard somewhere that the venom acts more or less as a digestive uh, juice and they just basically, uh, you know, inject them and then later uh, have a milkshake kind of thing. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that because in the slide I showed you setting up the, the video, um, I meant to point out that they have fangs that they inject venom with, but they also have a mouth. And so, um, and they, they exert um, digestive enzymes through their mouth. So they have a set of chemicals that's um, intended for rapid immobilization, probably some things that start digestion. Um, we don't fully understand the full set of function in them because they're so complex, but they, they have a separate digestive enzyme. So what they'll do is immobilize and then start to literally vomit out digestive enzymes and then digest externally and drink them up. Like they can't put food in their mouths. The harvestmen, Apillionis, actually can put big chunks of food in their mouths, but spiders digest externally and slurp it up. So they have like a filter that keeps the bits out of, of their digestive system. Yeah. Um, 
The question is, is that a process that happens all, together all the time? Um, no, I mean, they, often spiders will, some spiders will bite and step back and let the venom do all the work before they go back and actually start to um, vomit out digestive enzymes. Others, like tarantulas, often bite down and then hold them and then just start to macerate. So they might start to you know, vomit out digestive enzymes pretty quickly. So some spiders just crush things into a ball. Others, like the crab spiders that ambush prey, will make a hole so they, they, they envenomate, they hold on, um, and then they, they make a hole and, and um, uh, vomit out their digestive enzymes and slurp it up through that hole. So um, I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Does certain venom, like, do some spiders, like, conserve food? Do they conserve food? Do you mean they, do they keep their prey alive for a while? Or what do you mean by conserve exactly? Or, like, if they don't eat it right that second, can they, like, just wrap it in web or something to conserve it? That's a really good later? question. And the, we think the answer to that is yes. In fact, I've done some experiments myself where I let um, black widows bite an insect and then take it away and just watch it and those will stay alive for 48 hours. They're immobilized, they don't recover from the Im being immobilized, but I can see that their, their hearts are beating and there's hemolymph pumping around. So um, there's an argument that they might be keeping the prey fresh, for example, we, we, why they do that, we can only speculate, but, um, but a lot of spiders do leave their prey just immobilized. How long do they live? <laughs> I'm a, who, who, where was that? <laughs> this person in front put the microphone to his mouth and then another voice came. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the question is how long do they live? That varies a lot. Like a lot of the, in general, araneomorphs don't live as long. So maybe one or two years for females, but only one year for the males. Um, but that's highly variable. The six-eyed sand spiders, we have some we collected in Namibia in 2004 and they're still alive in our lab. So um, we know that they live at least 13 years. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of variation. Some tarantulas can live up to 30 years, but the average lifespan is much, much smaller, much shorter. Okay, so you said that, um, that venoms are specific to different types of, like you have crustaceans and vertebrates and stuff like that. Um, and <clears throat> acknowledging that like vertebrates, like there's so many, diff like, so many differences. What is like the specific factor that kind of like unifies this venom being specific for all of these vertebrates. Like, like what m molecularly makes them yeah, specific? Yeah, like specific towards the vertebrates You know, that's like a really good question and we don't really understand. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of what's illustrated by, like there's, a, there's subtle variation in the nervous systems that these molecules recognize and bind to. So something sl slightly different. I mean, the, the, there are these, um, for example, the chemicals get passed and forth, back, back and forth through um, channels that are basically proteins that you know make a hole in the cell surface, and they're pr probably slightly different molecular components to those proteins across. I mean, the, the the time span since we've shared a common ancestor with insects is very long ago, um, so 500 million years, and uh, so there's been that much time for even minor differences to have evolved that would make it so that that toxin would not bind to a, a vertebrate version of something that's also found in an insect. Right? And it's kind of the same concept of like this antigenic recognition. Um, at some point, the molecules are going to just be different in very subtle ways such that proteins don't recognize them anymore, or antibodies don't recognize them anymore, if that makes sense. Um, my sister-in-law in Connecticut um, was diagnosed after probably maybe a month or so after her bite with a brown recluse bite and her whole chest had to be regrafted because of the necrosis. But according to your map, there's no brown recluse up in Connecticut. Any uh, they ideas? Didn't, they didn't of what ask it my was? opinion on that diagnosis. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say it's highly unlikely that yeah. it was a, a brown recluse bite, given just based on geography. We yeah. can't rule it out, but sometimes there are little um, patches of these spiders that colonize areas. But there, are, given her ge geographic area, there are so many other more reasonable differential diagnoses mm -hmm. that should come first. Um, and, uh, and this is something that, you know, there's some active people trying to educate 
folks about, like medical professionals about, uh, about these issues, but um, Staphylococcus, MRSA, is one of the key things that uh, tends to affect people. That folks that have, um, I'm not sure, this is probably not true for your relative, but um, if there are underlying conditions like diabetes or um, uh, then people can react to stimuli in ways that look like der dermatocrotic lesions. Um, and we don't really fully understand what's going on with that. Uh, something I didn't tell you about these bites is that, uh, so the molecule snips the sphingomyelin on the cell surface. Um, that's not what causes the lesion. Something about that kicks on a cascade of an immune response, and the body ultimately shuts down blood flow to the, flow to the bite site. So it's, a, it's an immune reaction, something called the complement system, if any of you are in, in the medical profession, but that gets turned on and then you get this constriction of blood vessels around the bite and our bodies commit tissue suicide. Um, so we don't understand what causes that, but there are other things that might stimulate the nervous system in a similar way. Um, but it's a complex thing to diagnose and I think that the misdiagnosis is a spider bite. Uh, that often makes people feel good. It's like, okay, I have this horrible, undefined lesion, having something to blame is, might be comforting, even if it's wrong, but it's, it doesn't help with treatment. But at that point, after the spider bite, that far after the bite, spider bite, it doesn't really matter what caused it because you can't treat the, the bite any longer. It's something else that's happening. What piqued oh. your interest to get into this field, and how many times have you been bitten? <laughs> <laughs> How often do you get asked that question? How many I get times asked you... that question a lot, and the answer is really usually kind of, uh, I've never been bitten by this, these spiders that have the toxins. The only time I was bitten was when I was an undergraduate studying these innocuous social spiders that are tiny little things, and they, they're spiders that live together in webs. This is linked to how I got into this, actually. They're spiders that live together in webs, and they work together to maintain their web, they feed each other's babies, they work together to capture prey. And I was trying to grab one, and I pinched its sister with my elbow, and it felt like a little tiny prick. That is the unglorious story for me being bitten. But I've, you know, I crawl around. You saw that in caves on my belly collecting these guys, and I've still never been bitten, just because you're... You know, we're very acutely aware of where we put our hands and our feet at all times when we're in places where these are, are dense. Um, I got into spiders. I grew up on a farm, spent all my time outside just exploring, and so it was very natural for me to roll over things like dried cow patties and things and see what was underneath. Um, but then as an undergraduate, I was invited to work on a project in Peru that had to do with these social spiders. And I realized first that I had the potential to be a scientist. I had no idea. I did not see myself as being a scientist, as a rural Midwestern young woman. Two, we know so little about biodiversity that I could make a contribution. And three, the process of figuring out what the unanswered questions are and figuring out the, how to answer those questions with data was really riveting to me. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh. I want to make sure it gets spread around and there are other microphones, but yeah. Uh. I live here in town, I moved a few times, I rented a U-Haul, and I could have sworn it was a brown recluse when I opened the door for the first time to load my stuff. And it, are they fast running? No, they actually kind of sit there if they're oh. startled. Um, if, you, if, they, if you wait long enough, they'll dash off. Oh, this wasn't one then. I was just thinking with Connecticut, couldn't U-Hauls bring them to every state? Oh yeah, things get moved around. Yeah. But still, if you're trying to think about, in the absence of having good evidence, like a spider or a, a, a biopsy, you want to think about all the possible explanations. Spider bites there, we can't rule it out, but there are other more logical mm -hmm. explanations. For example, if you have a cold sore and you, got, you get a little wound and you get that into the wound, you wow. can get a lesion that looks like a brown recluse bite. Tick bites often look like a necrosis, oh, yeah. a necrotic lesion. So there's, there's a long list. You can Google differential diagnoses of spider bites and, um, and you'll hit some things. And since you all have been here, you are welcome to look me up. And if you, have a, if you think you have a brown recluse, take a picture of it, even a bad picture. I can tell you whether or not it's a brown recluse. I get these all the time and I'm happy to do that. So um, are, are there up here? Uh -huh. You mentioned uh, that the uh, ticks are part of this family. They're part of the, the, um, the bigger group, the, the order. But is there any relationship between the tick venom or the tick bite or the effect of that and spider? Um, 
Well, so ticks don't have venom per se in that they, they don't use it to immobilize prey. They, have, they basically use something like saliva um, when they bite vertebrates that does a whole bunch of things. Like um, one thing, it's an anesthetic, so you don't feel it latch on. Um, it loosens up the blood so they can slurp it up a little bit better. So it's, it's biochemically, it has a, a pretty different role. That said, there's an, an enzyme that's related to the toxin and the brown recluse venom that's been found in one tick. Um, it's not widespread, but it's been found in one tick. We don't know what the role of it is, and it's a very dif distantly related, so um, we don't think that it's causing necrosis from tick bites, but it, we don't actually know. Um, what do the... Can people be allergic to... Where are you? I'm sorry. Here. Okay. Can people be allergic to the non-poisonous spiders? And what do the bites look like of the non-poisonous spiders? Um, uh, most spiders, if they bite you, you'll just get a little red spot, if you notice it at all, or a little, little sting. Um, unlike insects, spiders don't have things that cause an itching reaction. So if you have something that itches, it's probably not a spider bite. Spider bites, if they, they might have an initial sting, or a brown recluse, you don't feel a bite normally. You just gets get sore after a few hours. Um, but if it's itchy, it's more likely an insect. And if you have a whole series of bites, um, it's probably not a spider that was hanging out in bed with you, just biting you repeatedly. It's more likely that it was a, a, a flea or something, actually. But, yeah. Uh, when my husband and I moved here in 2003, we had the golden orb weeper spiders everywhere in our yard. Lucky you. And then after about three or four years, they just disappeared, and they weren't there for a number of years. And then a couple of years ago, we started noticing them come back. Not as many, but they're back. Is there something that would explain that? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, they're, I, they're kind of patchy. So... Um, yeah, no, nothing other than they're patchy. <laughs> so one of them probably laid an egg sac nearby and they ballooned in, um, but yeah. We don't, uh, and I know that because part of the Caribbean research we're doing is we've been trying to find those spiders. We can look at an, enti an entire island and not see them, and then we'll find a patch where there are about 50. So, yeah. Okay, maybe one more question? Yes. Up in Maine, I picked up a wolf spider, I think. Uh-huh. And I didn't notice it first, but looking at its back more closely, the back became alive with hundreds of babies. Yes. <laughs> and I'm wondering, we can, as a species, feed one or two at the same time, but how does a spider go about feeding hundreds of babies on its back? Isn't that cool? So yeah, wolf spiders and some other arachnids, actually, after the egg sacs hatch, so wolf spiders carry around their egg sac. You'll see, if you see spiders with an egg sac attached to the back end, um, that's a wolf spider. And when the egg sac hatches, they crawl up onto the mother's back. And the mother has these special hairs that they just kind of hold on to. And then when she catches prey, they will crawl off of her back and feed and share her prey um, and then go back onto her back. Sweet, okay. huh? Let's, <laughs> that was a great last question. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. It was awesome. <laughs> All right, go forth and admire your arachnids. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs>